This is a death certificate. Have they found something? What's going on? You two have deranged, right? I got a, a call from some journalist 15 minutes ago who was breaking the story. A man that was arrested in Brighouse yesterday. He uh, killed his wife, and then he, he tore off and ate her face. He's linking the killings directly to deranged. Oh, God. Enid, why did you allow deranged to be released? You, you, you can't afford to make mistakes. <sighs> That's all I've got of Norths. It's a bit of a ropey cop. He might be a bit fuzzy and all good bits, and, uh, well, someone's taped over the end with another film. It makes me think, in my psychotherapy days, we talk about how people construct stories to cope. Yeah, you'd be surprised what the human brain can edit out when it can't handle the truth. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Ending Explained, and today we are talking about the mind-bending horror thriller film, Censor. If you're new to the channel, be sure to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to get videos just like this. And if you've never seen the movie Censor, be wary because we are going to be talking about lots of spoilers throughout. And without any further ado, Pink and Blue Censor. The film opens in 1984 with our main protagonist, Enid, who is looking through a movie to decide what needs to be censored out in order for it to get an R rating. The colors within the film that she's watching are very red and very blue, and this is an aesthetic that we will see throughout the movie bleeding out of the video nasties and into the reality that is her own as the movie progresses. Her co-worker asks if they need to remove the decapitation scene, to which she says, Nope. No, the decapitation is ridiculous. Ironically, this is foreshadowing the end of the film and may even be the inspiration behind her delusion, but more on that later. At a train station, she sees a redhead who she thinks is her sister, but clearly it is not. Enid meets her parents for a very late 9pm dinner at a restaurant where they present her with a death certificate for her sister who has been missing for several years. Her death certificate reads, Nina Baines, April 13th, 1958 to September 5th, 1965, which would roughly make her sister about seven years old and basically means she's been missing for about 15 years if this movie is to take place as early as 1980. Which honestly, yeah, after 15 years of being missing, how could you not assume that she's dead at that point, right? In fact, based on a scene that we see where Margaret Thatcher is given a speech, I place this film in 1984. In the speech, Thatcher was talking about the Brighton Hotel bombing that took place on October 12th, 1984. So yeah, she's been missing for 19 years. I'm actually kind of shocked they haven't done this sooner. Enid, of course, doesn't take this news lightly, protesting that her sister still could be out there somewhere. Her mother says, You've never been clear on exactly what you remember. The parents clearly know that Enid has some mental issues. I mean, they even give her a copy of the death certificate as a way of hoping that the information will sink into Enid's head because they know she's not very sharp when it comes to memory. That's a copy for you to keep. Oh, thank you. It's what I always wanted. Anyway, she goes home and looks through old photos of her sister and we see an old news clipping that reads, The red-haired, blue-eyed girl was wearing a white dress, yellow tights, and dark Wellington boots on the day she went missing. After their older daughter came home alone, saying she had lost sight of Nina whilst they were playing in the woods. Something, something kidnapping? Can't read the rest. Either way, it causes Enid to then have a flashback to that day. Oh yeah, there's also this whole B storyline about how crime is on the rise and these video nasties that Enid is reviewing is somehow to blame, which is completely ridiculous, but actually a real thing that people did back in 1984 and still seem to do every couple of years more recently with music and video games whether it be Marilyn Manson being blamed for uh, school shootings or video games like Grand Theft Auto being the reason that children are so violent again complete horseshit in the next scene we see Enid being brought into her boss's office where she finds out that one of the movies that she cleared called deranged has become the focus of sudden media attention a man dubbed the Amnesiac Killer has killed his entire family after watching a violent cannibal film that she approved, which results in him using a media as a motive defense. I've got the perfect defense, Sid. I'm gonna blame the movies. Which is the lamest excuse because as we all know, movies don't make psychos, movies make psychos more creative. I really love the movie Scream, come at me. The strange thing about this is that her boss says that a journalist called and said that he knew that Enid and her co-worker were the ones that reviewed and cleared this particular title, which is an odd thing for the film to point out. 
How could they possibly know? Did Enid leak it to the journalist? Did somebody else in the building? I also found it a bit odd that the amnesiac killer couldn't remember killing his family, which is a very strong and not subtle parallel to the fact that Enid couldn't remember what happened to her sister. You never were clear. I mean, honestly, in my opinion, I think this entire scene is just to throw the audience off. The amnesiac killer is just a theme and has no real purpose at all in the movie. Yes, it builds tension around Eden as she now feels responsible for what happened, and her boss is turning the heat up on her, and I get why they do it, but it's a subplot that sadly never sees a real resolution. We never find out who leaked Eden's identity to the press. Was it her? Was it her coworker? And if so, why? She gets harassing phone calls, the press bombard her, and co-workers essentially start to look down on her for making a mistake. The following day, we meet smarmy asshole movie producer Doug Smart, who hits on Enid and is basically as subtle as a brick through a window. Quick side note though, he does in fact seem to recognize her. So this is Enid. Have we met? No. Could he be the guy that kidnapped Nina 20 years ago? Probably not. Also, if you recognize this actor, it's because it's Michael Smiley, who was both in The World's End and Shaun of the Dead from the Cornito trilogy. Anyway, Eden of course blows him off, and he goes on his merry way. Anyway, she watches a film produced by said slimy film producer called Don't Go in the Church, directed by Frederick North, in which two young girls can be seen in the woods playing the same spin-around game that we saw in Eden's flashback. This, of course, now resonates with Enid, and she starts seeing things a bit more subjectively instead of objectively, which she has been doing to the T since the very beginning. We see wind chimes hanging in the distance, and they're not quite the same ones that we saw in Enid's flashback, but they're close enough. In the movie, the one girl dares the other girl to go into the cabin, which is definitely not a church, before picking up an axe, going in there behind her, and killing her brutally. Mind you, for me, this scene really clears up the question on whether or not Ina did in fact murder her sister Nina, to which I would argue absolutely no. I mean, look at her face. She doesn't look like she's guilt-ridden. She looks absolutely terrified at the notion that this could have actually happened to her sister, and she's disturbed by it. I mean, not to mention, she sees the spinning in the scene, she has a flashback. She sees the chimes hanging, she has a flashback. She sees the murder, nothing. Sure, she's disturbed by it, and it simply could be because she is now filling in the missing pieces of her own broken story, using a fictional one that has some similarities, but not once do we get any real indication that Nina was murdered that day. This scene seems to deal more with the power of suggestion. The girl holding the axe is then seen transforming into a werewolf-looking man, better known as Beast Man. And if you don't believe this theory, well hold on because the next scene is going to spoon feed it to you by her co-worker Perkins. To which he says, People construct stories to cope. You'd be surprised what the human mind can edit out when it can't handle the truth. Which is absolutely the main thread on this movie. Whenever you wonder what's going on, just keep that one line of dialogue in your mind. It's completely what this movie is all about. That night, Eden has a dream. This time, she is blending her memory with the film she watched. The chimes from the movie, the cabin from the movie, the red and blue lighting rather than the angelic whites we saw before. Much like Perkins said a scene earlier, she is filling in the missing gaps. And it all ends with a giant jump scare in which her mother is telling her that it's all her fault. From there, she decides to follow up on the director and see if there might be any clues on her sister and any of the other films. She goes to the local video store where she sees a poster for Beast Man, the character also seen in Don't Go in the Church. Alright, pause a second. Is it just me? Or does it feel like all of these movies are the same exact movie? I know they say at a certain point in the movie that it's a franchise and sequels are all the rage, but honestly, every single movie seems to be the same thing. Girl in white who's in danger, we're in the woods, blue light, red light, and beast man who comes out of nowhere to kill. How can that be the same thing in what feels like four different movies? And hell, while I'm at it, why is he even called Don't Go in the Church? That's clearly not a church. I guess Don't Go in the Cabin was already taken, but come on, man. Right? Anyway, she asks the guy at Blockbuster if he has any more Frederick North films, and he gives her one called Asunder. Oh, and she also sees a video called The Day the World Began, which is something we're going to come back to later. She watches Asunder and sees what she thinks is her sister Nina as one of the actresses. She goes immediately to tell her parents about it, and... They don't believe her because, well, because it's not. Yeah, this is clearly the study of a woman who has been grieving for nearly 20 years and can't come to any sense of acceptance. In fact, in a weird way, they probably should have just left well enough alone because by doing this, 
they have taken away that tiny little bit of hope that Eden was still holding on to, which, ergo, caused her to go to extremes. Could she have gone to extremes anyway? Probably. But did this help? Doubtful. That night, while watching Asunder again, she has the same dream as before, only this time she sees Nina grown up as Alice Lee. She goes in the cabin with Beastman, presumably to her death. All your life, not all your love, all your hate, all your memory, all your pain, it was all the same thing. It was all the same dream, a dream that you had inside a locked room. The following day, she goes to the house of douchey film producer Doug Smart to see if she can find out any additional information. I was in the area. <laughs> I love that line. He tells her that Frederick North is filming a sequel to Beastman tomorrow and that Alice Lee is going to be in it in her final film. Sequels are all the rage these days. Alright, fine. So I guess this does answer my question from before about why do all these movies look the same? They're all the same franchise, but come on, it's a little bit derivative. Do something different. Anyway, things start to escalate with Doug not so smart when Eden pushes him off, resulting in him landing on the award, killing him, impaled on the very award that he was showing her. I mean, you gotta love the irony here. The guy with a giant ego literally chokes on his own award. And of course, even the award is depicting a woman who is holding an axe, making you wonder how much of this is actually real or just a depiction in Enid's mind. Thank you for the whiskey. I'll see myself out. I'm betting it's that one. Someone's losing the plot. Anyway, back at home, Eden is watching a static screen, and hot take, this is where reality goes completely off the rails, and everything else in Act 3 is entirely just a dream. I mean, look at these surreal transitions. Furthermore, if you speed the film up, you'll realize the aspect ratio slowly transitions from letterbox to 4x3, an aspect ratio that was extremely prevalent for VHS tapes back in the day because TVs were shaped more like squares and not rectangles. You could also argue that as the third act goes on that the walls coming in is simply a metaphor for Enid having tunnel vision in her skewed perception of reality. She arrives at the shooting location and Debbie the makeup woman doesn't think twice. She sees an article on the front page of the newspaper reading, Corrupt film censor hooked on banned video nasties. Yeah, okay, a bit egotistical, don't you think? I don't think the story would make page six, let alone the cover. Not to mention, just the day before, they announced that the movie Depraved had absolutely nothing to do with the amnesiac killer. So, you didn't even watch it? That's what it says here. So why would this even be on the paper if it wasn't just a manifestation of Enid's mind? The character Enid is allegedly playing, of course, is the sister character to Alice Lee's character, which, holy shit, has to be the biggest coincidence of all time. I mean, they're both wearing those white dresses again. All these clues seem to hint that everything that we are seeing simply isn't happening on account that there are way too many occurrences of happenstance for it to actually be believed. So, for example, you might go into a dream and there we start to introduce, you know, pinks or purples in the lighting. And then when we come back out of the dream, those pinks and purples are there in her real world. But it's very subtle, you know, and the same goes for the camera movement and the costume. You know, Enid starts very much aligned color wise with her background. And as she breaks away from the world she starts out in, the, the costume colors sort of start to break away. So they're all you know, all these little details that I'm pointing out, but we don't want anybody to notice. Well, I hate to tell you, we did. I mean, the director inside the dream even says, Improvise. Take control of your story. You can't convince me that we're not in full inception mode right now. Which brings me to theory number three, that everything from this very point forward is in fact just the finished, improvised film put out by Frederick North. Crazy, right? Especially since the director put himself in his own movie. But if you think about it, what do we know? The cast and crew didn't show up, he's filming her by himself, and he's telling her to improvise. There were quite a few films within this film. There's a director called Frederick North in the film, and I was imagining how Frederick North would direct this film so that it would become a kind of authentic film from the 70s or 80s. I mean, is it really so hard to believe that the director would actually break the fourth wall in this one? I mean, it's like chapter five, he's got no production value, nobody believes in him, and it's definitely something that Wes Craven would do. Damn little shits. Would you call me? Enid goes in the cabin, oh I'm sorry, church, carrying an axe and sees the beast man. 
He hugs her in an embrace, like a scene out of Beauty and the Beast, before he grabs Alice Lee and threatens to kill her. Eden attacks the Beast Man slash actor and kills him instantly. The director rushes in and BOOM! Kills him too. Very much like the scene in the beginning of the film. She chases Alice Lee into the woods and proclaims that they are sisters. Alice completely disagrees with Enid and she proceeds to have her 19th nervous breakdown. Unable to cope, she lies down and imagines a remote control that she would often use to review and edit movies at work. She pushes a button and we are transported back to 4x3 aspect ratio. A white glowing light appears and we see Nina come to comfort Enid saying, We should go home. Along the way, we see flashes of something far more grim. When they are driving the car for a brief moment, we can actually see that Alice Lee is actually screaming because she has been kidnapped. When they get to the Paris house, the horror continues as for a brief moment we can see Alice Lee is not in fact her sister, but a petrified actress who has been kidnapped by a serial killer. However, this is not what Eden sees. Eden sees a bright rainbow and a happy family an inspiration that she took from one of the videotapes that we saw earlier. She looks at the camera one last time, and the screen goes to black before showing a VHS popping out of a VCR titled, of course, Censor. Quick note, maybe this is a very meta inside joke with the movie, but I can't help but think of what the man at the video rental store said earlier, that the film she rented had an ending that was recorded over, and how it parallels to what Eden has done here, either in her dream or in her broken perception of reality. Even from early on, we get glimpses of Enid's sanity slipping. Lights turn off from above her head when she walks down a corridor. In the beginning of the film, she says, I just want to get it right. We can't afford to get it wrong. I'm cutting it. Which is some heavy foreshadowing in how Eden treats her own life. As someone who has gone through so much trauma, her only defense mechanism is to cut it out the way she would with a movie. Kind of like a selective memory, if you will, protecting her from the trauma that she has endured. After my first viewing of Censor, I believe that it was simply a case of Eden snapping and killing a lot of people, despite not fully knowing what she was doing. However, after a second viewing, I'm gonna have to say that everything was absolutely theory number two, in which everything was a dream, starting in Act 3. Not only is the decapitation mentioned in the beginning, not only do we get a snippet of said decapitation, also with an axe, but the very movie she is starring in, is seen earlier in the film in a screening room. And I'm sorry, it just looks way too similar for it to be part of the same franchise. It's not the same franchise, it's the same movie. And yes, I suppose you could argue that the movie was going through some reshoots or hell, maybe it was a sequel or something like that, but I find it highly unlikely. The more reasonable explanation is that everything from this moment forward in which we travel through the TV is completely fake. A dream, perhaps, that Eden had while trying to reconcile the memories of her missing sister, the film she has seen, and now the real-life death of this smarmy film producer. It makes a lot of sense if you think about it. I mean, I'll take it a step further. Despite being a low-budget movie, I have a hard time believing that Enid would be able to get away with all the things that she has done on this movie set. She gets into the movie despite clearly not being the correct actress. She kills not one guy, but also the director in a very over-the-top way. And even if that axe was real, you mean to tell me that not a single person would have tackled her to the ground? That she would be able to leave the cabin, kidnap an actress, drive all the way to her parents' house without a single person intervening? I mean, hell, she's not even completely lucid while doing this. Her mind keeps shifting between the reality of the movie that's red and blue and the reality of the rainbow. There's no way she can carry on this way while also losing her mind, in my opinion, which is why I gotta really stick to that theory. It's all a dream. I mean, is it possible? Perhaps. Stranger things have happened, but I find it highly unlikely. I think it was all a dream. Her mind trying to reconcile her life the best that she can using anchors and imagery that she knows. We may never know what happened to Enid's sister, and that's fine. What is relevant is that Eden holds herself personally responsible for what happened to her. In all actuality, it probably wasn't even her fault. After all, she was just a child at the time. But she must have seen something that traumatized her and made her the way that it is. I mean, yeah, she could have been disturbed for a lot of different reasons, but I'm... I just have a gut feeling that something she saw in those woods traumatized her for a life. Just a gut feeling. I'm not trying to disagree and say that mental illness doesn't start early on, that it takes something to push her over the edge, but there's just a gut feeling that she saw something in those woods and we're never gonna know. 
According to co-writer-director Prano Bailey Bond, she said, In writing a character like Enid, you need her to have enough deep flaws there to begin with to enable her to go on the journey that she's been going on. There was a lot of discussion in the development process about how she cracked and how reliable she was to begin with, and where and when we start to see those little cracks emerging. You were never exactly clear on what happened. I spoke to a few film censors and women who had worked as censors in the 80s. Understanding the job was really important to us, and really inspiring. Hearing about their experiences helped us to tune into Enid's day to day. When discussing the origins of the film, she said, I was on a plane reading this article about the Hammer Horror error, and one point jumped out at me. There was this comment that one of the things that film censors looked out for at the time was blood on the breast, as they believed at the time that seeing this would likely make men want to commit rape. So any image of blood on breast would be instantly cut from these films. That was a moment when I became really fascinated may be obsessed with the jobs of film censors. They have to be both objective and subjective in their roles all at once. But what happens if the subjective element takes over? The more I researched film censorship, the more I was drawn to the world of video nasties. I'd grown up watching films like The Evil Dead and The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But what went around these films, socially and politically in the UK, is as fascinating to me as the films themselves. In the early to mid-1980s when VHS first came about, there was a boom in low-budget horror being created, as these films could now go direct-to-video and direct-to-the-home. There was no form of censorship in place for the video, as it was a new piece of technology. The films being censored were those screening in cinemas, so off the back of this, there was an outburst of social hysteria and moral panic. People thought these videos were going to corrupt society and give birth to the next generation of murderers and rapists. When asked about the film's ending, Bond said, Film is the art form that most closely resembles our dreams. Cinema can transport us. I channel some of my feelings about cinema and storytelling into the film's ending. The idea that watching and making films can be cathartic. That we can have a happy ending in films, even if that's not always the case in real life. I always wanted Ina to have a happy ending, and in her film she can. I hope the audience want that for her too. I want to create something glorious, warm, everything Ina ever dreamt of. But underneath all of this, there's still something really dark and painful. Which is pretty cool and profound, and kind of gives more weight to my theory about being a dream the whole time. But you know what? Before I'm done, I'm going to throw one more theory at you. Theory number four. And say that the death of slimeball movie producer Doug Smart wasn't even real. The idea of this cheap, not sharp hatchet award being able to impale the back of this guy's head is absolutely absurd. In all actuality, it probably would have just broke the award or pushed it off the table completely. So theory number four is going with the idea that A, in reality, she finished her drink and actually thanked him before leaving, leaving him perfectly well enough alone, or B, the much darker theory that Doug Smart actually took full advantage of Enid, sexually assaulting her, and this caused her to break down completely mentally, rewriting everything in her mind where her assailant is now dead, the director is now dead, and her sister is found and saved. It's a dark theory, but I think it works. I'm not sure how much I like the idea of being raped and cut into pieces on camera. No, but I'm sure the public would love it. So, you movie lovers, what theory do you subscribe to? Number one, she really killed those people. Number two, she killed no one, it was a dream. Number three, what we were seeing in Act 3 is the improvised work of Frederick North, his latest film. Or number four, Eden never killed Doug Smart. Whether you go to option A, she left after the drink, or option B, he took advantage of her. Comment down below and tell us what theory you agree with, or even better yet, if you have a theory of your own, we would love to know down in the comments. I personally think it was theory number two, that she didn't kill anybody, but rather had a dream in which she blended her memories with the past. It's all just a bit too far-fetched for me to believe that any of this could have actually happened the way it did. Not to mention how it all feels a little bit too surreal like a dream. In my opinion, dreams are an expression of what you're repressing during the time that you're awake. Dreams provide messages of loss or neglected parts of ourselves that need to be reintegrated. Many dreams simply come from a preoccupation with the day's activities, but some offer rich symbolic expression. 
In the case of Enid, I think what we are seeing are the emergent pieces of her psyche come together as she tries to reconcile her past while using what she knows from her present. The film itself has a bit of a weird theme, and it's a message that's a bit unclear. On the one hand, it's saying that cinema, or even art, shouldn't be blamed for the actions of others. I mean, hell, we even find out that the amnesiac killer didn't even see the film deranged, and it was just the making of some shitty journalist. However, at the same time, the film backpedals on the idea, trying to imply that Enid was in fact corrupted by watching all these movies. That by watching them, she was traumatized and even influenced to carry out such heinous acts, whether it be in her dreams or in reality. The fact that we never really know for sure if Enid becomes a murderer allows the film to have its cake and eat it too almost creating a Joker situation where the audience can believe whatever they want to believe, thus making a film that everyone can enjoy. Which to me can be a bit frustrating. There's a very thin line between open to interpretation and lazy screenwriting that doesn't fully commit to what it stands for. I will say this much though, Enid definitely slowly and progressively loses her sanity as the film goes on, blurring the lines of reality and making it much harder for us, the audience, to decipher what's real by the end of the film. One thing that I should say before wrapping this essay up is that the direction is incredibly intoxicating, and the performance that Niam Algar gives as Enid is fantastic. The amount of empathy and humanity she brings to the character was incredibly nuanced. I wanted to give her a hug the entire time. I also love the little touches that she gave to the character where whenever she got anxious she would just start scratching her cuticle on her thumb. Or when she couldn't take anymore she would just recenter herself by touching her shoulders and taking a deep breath. All great stuff. But what did you think of the ending of Sensu? Do you agree with our theories or maybe you have one of your own? Comment down below. And if you want more video essays just like this, be sure to subscribe to our channel, Birds Reviews. And until next time, guys, thank you so much for watching. I've been John here on Birds Reviews. You just got burned and we will see you next time.